Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for this fifth installment of our Biotelemetry for the Life Sciences webinar series that began in early 2015. My name is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Today's webinar titled Exploring ICP Tissue Oxygenation and RSNA with Implantable Telemetry is sponsored by Millar and will provide insight into some novel applications and best practices for implantable telemetry in small rodents via a case study approach. Our first speaker today is Dr. Fiona McBride, a research fellow at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, who will discuss her recent experience working with rats, where she has successfully instrumented subjects with two telemeters, permitting continuous recording of arterial blood pressure intracranial pressure, and brain oxygenation. Importantly, Dr. McBride will share tips and prescribed best practices for both single and dual telemeter implantation and discuss experimental design for more complex multi-parameter research studies. Our second speaker today is Dr. Jacqueline Phillips, Professor of Neuroscience at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Phillips will discuss highlights from her recent paper titled, Direct Conscious Telemetry Recordings Demonstrate Increased Renal Sympathetic Nerve Activity in Rats with Chronic Kidney Disease, specifically focusing on how scientists can successfully acquire continuous RSNA data and should approach data analysis. Prior to starting our speaker presentations today, we will bring Dr. Sandy Lau, staff scientist at Millar Online, to provide us with a brief introduction to the Millar telemetry technology that both Dr. McBride and Dr. Phillips will be referring to during their talks today. Uh, thank you, Martin. So, uh, as you know, my name is Sandy. I'm a staff scientist at Millar. And today I'm just going to very briefly provide some background on the technology used by speakers in this webinar to touch on, and I'm going to touch on some components of the Miller system, how it works, and introduce our new co-housing feature. So the Miller telemetry system has three components, reusable telemeters with rechargeable batteries, smart pads, and the configurator system. Now we have a large family of telemeters which can measure signals such as biopotential, that's your ECG, EMG or EEG, pressure such as left ventricular pressure or a combination of both uh, biopotential and pressure. We can also measure tissue oxygen concentration and concurrent sympathetic nerve activity and pressure, which distinguishes our product line from other systems. If you're interested in more details, please visit our website, www.miller.com. Now, in the Miller system, each telemeter is set on any one of 30 distinct data transmission frequencies, which we call channels. Having channels prevents interference between setups without the need for shielding. Each implanted rat um, in its cage um, sorry, is then housed on top of a smart pad which is set to the same channel. Smart pads are receivers for the biological data sent by the telemeters as well as charging pads that monitor and recharges the telemeter batteries. As there are 30 channels available, it means that a lab can run up to 30 uh, telemetry setups at any one time. The smart pads are, uh, can then be connected to any standard data acquisition hardware that uses analog inputs for data collection. Now finally, our, our configurator system consists of the configurator hardware and the ConfigSoft software, which together allows the user to change the channels of telemeters and smart pads, as well as to enable or disable the co-housing feature of the system. So what exactly does this new co-housing feature do? Uh, co-housing allows a researcher to place two smaller animals, um, so for example larger than 175 grams, each implanted with a telemeter together in one cage. The second scenario is that co-housing allows one larger animal to be implanted with two telemeters. 
Now the advantages of housing two animals in one cage means you can house a larger number of telemetry setups if you have a smaller space, as well as reducing housing costs compared to individually housing these animals. Additionally, rats are social animals and being socially isolated can be a source of distress for them. So from personal experience, I do feel that rats recover faster from surgery if they have a friend in their cage compared to being isolated straight away after surgery. In fact, social isolation is one of the points that the NC3R's organisation highlights that researchers should be aware of when conducting uh, telemetry studies. Now, co-housing can reduce distress relating to social isolation, but uh, the dual implantation actually allows implanting any two of a large range of telemeters in one animal. It allows for collecting more concurrent biological signals from one animal and even reducing the number of animals required for each study if you want to collect the same amount of variables. Um, Dr. Fiona McBride will talk a bit more about how she utilizes co-housing for dual implantation later on in this webinar. So I mentioned previously um, that the Miller smart pads have two functions, to receive biological data and to provide power. Now in co-housing, each telemeter is still set to a distinct data collection channel and paired with its own smart pad in a one-to-one -one ratio. So in a co-housing setup, you would still need to use two telemeters, two smart pads, and occupy two data collection channels. The designated primary and secondary smart pads still receive biological data from the telemeters they're paired with. So in this example, the primary smart pad that we've set to channel one receives data from the telemeter also set, from, uh, set on channel one. And the secondary smart pad set on channel two receives data from the telemeter set on channel two. What is different is that both animals or telemeters are housed on the designated primary smart pad. In co-housing, the primary smart pad can monitor the battery level of both telemeters one and two, keeping the battery of both telemeters appropriately charged, allowing for 24-7 data collection from both telemeters. So are there any effects on the quality of data received? Um, this is a representative screenshot of arterial pressure we obtained from two co-housed rats. You can see that on a beat-to-beat -beat basis, there is no impact on the quality of data. If you looked at a 24-hour period, there is no difference in the quality of the data or the quantity of data received when the animals are co-housed compared to when the animals are housed separately. With co-housing, you still get the same high-quality data expected from a Miller telemetry system as with single housing. What is different is that it allows dual telemeter implantation so you can actually collect more data from the same rat. So in summary, Muller co-housing feature helps address ethical concerns uh, around social isolation during telemetry experiments. It can reduce housing costs compared to singly housed animals, and you still get the high quality data expected from a Muller telemetry system. If you'd like more information, feel free to contact us on support at miller.com or visit our website at www.miller.com. So without further ado, I'll pass over control to Dr. Fiona McBride, who will talk about how she uses co-housing to simultaneously measure blood pressure, intracranial pressure, and brain oxygenation in her research. Thank you for the introduction, Sandy. Um, nice to see everybody here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about my uh, recent experiment, uh, experiences uh, developing the the use of um, dual telemeters, so that's two telemeters in one animal, as Sandy outlines. Um, so first I want to talk a little bit about what drove us to um, take this approach. Um, I'll give you um, some of my uh, experiences with surgical techniques and tips that we found um, helped um, with our success, and um, some pointers about how we house our dual telemetered animals 
then I'll show some examples of the data, that some of the wonderful data we've been able to collect using this approach um, and finish with a brief summary. So I'm not going to go into too much of the scientific um, backgrounds, but the, the general approach that, that drove us to wanting to record more signals in, in one animal was um, to look at what we call the selfish brain hypothesis, um, which is that uh, the compromisation of cerebral perfusion um, may be one of the factors that, that drives up arterial blood pressure. Um, and we felt that um, both intracranial pressure and um, the level of oxygen in the brain may be key um, factors in, in this relationship. And so, of course, that requires us to be able to make uh, a temporal assessment of intracranial pressure, brain tissue oxygen, and arterial pressure ideally simultaneously in the same animal. Um, uh, at the time this wasn't possible and, and we've, we've worked with um, Millar to develop this um, ability um, and the solution that, that we've um, worked with them is to be able to put dual telemeters, so two telemeters in, in one animal. So the key considerations for using this setup is uh, because you, you have to put, physically put two telemeters into the animal, you do need to use larger animals. So I've been using animals of at least 350 grams um, and often more between 350 and 400 grams. Um, and that's just purely so that they, they're bigger to cope with the extra weight and, and volume of the implanted telemeters. Uh, also, it's really important to be aware that, that you're going to have to do each individual telemeter surgery all in one go, so it's a much longer initial surgery to instrument the animals. Um, so this has important implications um, for both the, the rat and the surgeon. Um, for the rat, you, you, it's important to uh, consider giving extra pain relief um, and taking extra sort of intensive care after the surgery, so really putting in some extra effort to give them um, supplemental soft foods, maybe some fluid support. Um, in terms of your experiments, you should um, plan to allow a longer recovery time. I've been allowing uh, at least seven days after the initial surgery to let the rats re-establish a circadian rhythm before I would even consider recording the baseline period. Just a brief reminder about the, the surgical procedures. Um, I've, I think most people probably using the system would be looking at arterial pressure. I would suggest starting with that surgery um, and making sure that you are confident with the surgery before you push yourself in, into doing a, a longer surgical setup. Um, so you, you place, as I'm sure many of you know, um, you place the, the, the body of the sensor tip into the abdominal aorta and, and seal that in place and secure that in place. And so this would be the first part of the surgery I would do. Once I'd completed that, we would move on to putting the two telemeter bodies um, in the abdomen of the rat. So we align them, I've been aligning them, uh, one each side of the midline. Um, and it's really important to, to secure these in place with the suture tabs. So we, we put a stitch through uh, each of these suture tabs through the, the muscle wall. And this is especially important. We should do this probably always, but it's especially important with two telemeters because uh, the, the charging efficiency of these telemeters is dependent on these telemeters being parallel with the smart field. And if you've got two telemeters bumping to, into each other as the animal moves around and one of them goes side on, then, it, then the charging will be um, less efficient. So, so that was really important. After sort of completing the, the um, abdominal surgery and, and bringing the leads of the telemeters out, um, I then move on to tunnel these leads through up to the head. Um, so we have a 25 centimeter catheter um, with the, the same tip as the blood pressure for intracranial pressure recordings. And off the second telemeter, we would have the leads coming up for the brain oxygen, brain tissue oxygen recordings. So we tunnel them up, seal up the abdominal cavity um, and flip the rat over. You may find it easier to uh, tunnel the leads through and emerge uh, between the shoulder blades and then do a second tunneling to, to get them up to the head rather than doing it in one go. So to place the, the cranial um, recording 
uh, pressure electrodes and, and oxygen electrodes. Um, we use a stereotactic frame, and, and it's really important with this tunneling approach just to take extra care not to damage the sensing tips, but the tips of both the, the pressure sensors and the oxygen are, are very um, sensitive to being disturbed, so if you sort of, uh, you don't want to try and push it in uh, hard and get the tip caught in any tissue or anything, so we use a trocar to protect them for that. In terms of our, our placement on the head, um, I've generally placed the, the intracranial pressures subdurally, so we make a, a hole kind of at the base of the skull here, and the oxygen electrode, one of them is a, a reference electrode, which you can place stereotactically to any brain area that you wish to record from. It records from a, a small volume of brain tissue at, at the tip of the electrode. Um, and then you have the uh, auxiliary and um, ground electrodes, which uh, can be placed sort of anywhere that works with your setup. We then place some electrodes and screws to, to secure um, the electrodes in place and then seal it with a, a special, we, we don't use standard dental cement, uh, it's important with the intracranial pressure that you don't have a, a permanently solid structure around it because you're, you're risk damaging, damaging the catheter on explant. So we use a, a special kind of rubbery uh, cement instead. When you're securing the pressure catheter in place, again, just, just a little bit of extra care here will protect the longevity um, of your device with this, this sort of fragile tip. Um, sort of handling it very gently, um, we place it just under the skull, um, subgenerally, so it's sitting above the surface of the brain but between the skull. Um, and then, of course, if you're measuring intracranial pressure, you want to make sure that the cranium is intact. Um, so we would seal this hole around the telemeter lead with gel foam um, and some uh, vet bond or tissue adhesive to, to form a, a hard surface to that. So that, that would mean that the, there's no pressure leakage coming from outside out of the skull. And then, again, similar to the blood pressure, we would use a mesh pad uh, to attach to the surface of the skull and, and the screws um, and sort of give it a little bit of extra tension support to the, to the telemeter to hold it in place as the animal uh, moves their very mobile heads for grooming, um, etc. And again, so we use a special um, uh, rubber sort of dental uh, material which I've listed here. And all of this information uh, is available on the Miller website. There's a really useful uh, Miller Knowledge Centre, which has all these surgical videos, um, which is really useful for training or refreshing surgical techniques. Um, and of course, these these have also been published. Um, this is a paper that came out earlier this year describing the intracranial pressure um, approach, um, and an earlier paper describing the the brain uh, tissue oxygen approach. Um, it doesn't have to be brain tissue oxygen; you can measure oxygen to to other organs as well. In terms of the, the housing, um, as Sandy said, that the, the, you can't just do this with, with any old smart pad. They need to be special, specially configured, um, and you need to discuss with Muller about, about getting that set up. Um, and there's a, a range of ways that you can arrange these. Um, so with our rats, the, the, second, the secondary pad, which uh, is just monitoring and not doing any charging, that can be put off to the side or stacked up underneath, as long as it can receive the telemetry signal, um, you can sort of put it however it's convenient um, in your own lab. And here's an example of, of some of the, the data that we've been able to collect. Um, so here we've got uh, mean arterial pressure, intracranial pressure, brain tissue oxygen. So those are the three sort of base recordings. Uh, from these signals using some software approaches from arterial pressure, we can extrapolate respiration, uh, breath by breath respiration. Um, and also because you've got intracranial pressure and, and arterial pressure, you can also calculate cerebral perfusion pressure in, in real time. And this is just an example where we've given a, a brief exposure to hypercapnia. And you can see uh, it's in, dissolved in 100% oxygen. So of course you can see that the brain tissue oxygen increasing. Um, and the hypercapnia has quite a, a profound effect on the intracranial pressure as well. Um, so that's sort of demonstrating that the power of this technique to uh, make 
these real-time recordings of these signals all at once. So you're not limited, so, so those are the signals that we've been recording habitually, but you can kind of mix and match um, depending on your experiments of interest. Um, and I'm just going to finish with a little data slide showing uh, an animal that we set up that had blood pressure, intracranial pressure, and renal sympathetic nerve activity. Um, and I think you can just see by looking at this, you can get some, some hints at some of the, the, the real power uh, of the relationships. You can look at um, looking at this sort of relationship between um, ICP and SNA here. So just to briefly summarize, um, just be aware that, it, that it's a relatively demanding surgical setup both for the rat and the experimenter and you should, you should take that into account in planning and preparing to do these type of experiments. Very important to have good aseptic technique and post-surgical care. A longer recovery time, it'll make your data better. Um, I would be giving at least seven days. Um, just to have a you know really well recovered, happy rat that you're recording from. Uh, it gives you access to multiple signals um, with some possibilities of some really unique insights into the, the physiology um, underlying various conditions. Um, and there's plenty of support for, for further resources. So the Miller Knowledge Centre I mentioned earlier. Um, there's some really good methods papers out there. Um, and finally, if you're sort of starting from scratch, um, it can be useful to maybe build the skills and the, and the techniques through collaborations with, with other experts in the field. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about um, a paper we published recently to give you some idea of what we've used telemetry for and why we've used it. Um, so I'll put it into some experimental context for you. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the advantages and challenges we found with this particular telemetry technique um, and also give you some of the study outcomes that we achieved using it and then go through and talk about um, what we want to do next with the approach and the procedure. So this is the paper that we've published recently that um, you can refer to later if you'd like to that talks about um, the study, what we did and in this paper we also do mention some of the uh, technical aspects of the procedure. So what we wanted to do was to be able to use um, telemetry recordings to measure chronically sympathetic nerve activity and this has been part of an ongoing research program that we have that looks at factors that contribute to high blood pressure in association with chronic kidney disease and we needed an approach that would allow us to give us direct evidence of increased sympathetic nerve activity in association with high blood pressure and to be able to concurrently look at number of reflex responses in the current state to really get a good idea of how the autonomic nervous system was functioning. And I'm going to go through some examples for you today of some chemo reflex and acute stress responses that we looked at. So this is the the Holy Grail, this is what we wanted to get. We wanted to look at dual recordings of renal sympathetic nerve activity and blood pressure in the conscious animal in conditions that weren't compromised by handling stress or anesthesia. So in this particular image here, you can see here, these are our control animals that we studied, the Lewis rat strain. And this is the Lewis polycystic kidney rat, or LPK, which is a model of um, cystic kidney disease. In the top two panels here, you can see the original renal sympathetic nerve activity recording from animals in the conscious state in their home cage. And the bottom panel, you can see here the arterial pressure recording that was concurrently made. And what we were looking at was the activity of the renal nerve. And even here, and I think you'll get some indication that it appears to be greater in our diseased animals. And the blood pressure recording here, a significant increase in blood pressure in these animals. So how do we get there and what were we trying to achieve? So with regards to um, hypertension and chronic kidney disease, hypertension is a primary comorbidity for many of these patients and cardiovascular disease is the major cause of death in CKD, chronic kidney disease. One of the primary hypotheses in relation to drivers of high blood pressure in CKD is a global increase in sympathetic nerve activity that increases vascular tone and therefore total peripheral resistance. The importance of renal sympathetic nerves in this process has really been highlighted with the success of the recent renal denervation studies in patients with essential hypertension and also in regards to um, chronic kidney disease patients, there's been some success also. One of the underlying factors here though is that a local increase in renal sympathetic nerve activity is likely to drive renal and neural and hormonal mediators of hypertension. Of particular relevance, relevance to my talk is conditions such as polycystic kidney disease where increased muscle sympathetic nerve activity is a measure of sympathetic tone um, and high blood pressure have been demonstrated in patients before they show overt signs of renal dysfunction. So to measure sympathetic nerve activity, 
there are a number of different approaches that can be both indirect and direct. So with regards to using indirect measures of sympathetic nerve activity, you can measure circulating catecholamines as an estimate of global sympathetic nerve activity. You can also use total noradrenaline spillover techniques um, and this involves using uh, noradrenaline isotope dilution methodology which can either be a global effect or you can actually use direct catheterization to target specific organs such as the heart, the brain or the kidney and determine regional levels of activity. Another approach is to use um, the assessment of a relative fall in blood pressure after ganglionic blockade on the basis that there, a greater fall in blood pressure reflects greater vascular sympathetic tone maintaining the level of blood pressure. In humans, there's also been a number of ways of looking at this with regards to muscle sympathetic nerve activity, so muscle SNA recordings, where you measure efferent post-ganglionic nerve activity to skeletal muscle and typically that will be um, by the perineal nerve. These can be done with multi-unit and more recently single unit nerve recordings and it's got an advantage that you're recording intact axons in the conscious person. It's minimally evasive, um, however it is time consuming and technically quite difficult and requires expert in investigators and also willing patients. In animal models, typically what's used is anesthetised preparation to directly record from exposed sympathetic nerves where you can get baseline activity and you can also test reflex responses. Um, some of the advantages here is you can measure multiple nerves in the one preparation. However, um, it doesn't allow for longitudinal assessment of sympathetic nerve activity and anaesthesia is a confounding feature. So to our knowledge, there had been very few studies that directly examined renal sympathetic nerve activity chronically in animal models of um, CKD. So we've been examining this issue of hypertension and nerve activity in, um, as I mentioned, the Lewis polycystic kidney rat. And I'm just showing you here the histological phenotype of these animals. Um, these animals have very large kidneys by the time they're about 12 weeks of age. With, uh, as you can see here, here's the normal kidney, um, the normal renal tissue architecture, and here's the diseased animal showing these large cysts that occupy the kidney space that are fluid filled. So by about 12 weeks of age, these animals um, have quite marked renal damage. They're developing renal failure. And it's due to a mutation in a gene called uh, NEC8, and they're a rodent model of autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. The cysts start appearing by about three weeks of age, the hypertensive by six weeks of age, and they um, progressively develop renal failure from 12 weeks of age onwards. And we've been using these animals as a model to study the increased sympathetic nerve activity of, as a driver of hypertension in chronic kidney disease. And one of the first things we had to do was try and establish that sympathetic nerve activity was actually increased. So we've done this through a number of approaches initially, um, using some of the methods that I described earlier. We've looked indirectly, so we've looked at um, enhanced responses to ganglionic blockade. So if you look at this panel here, what we're looking at is a fall in blood pressure in response to the ganglionic blocker hexamethonium. These are our control animals that had a fall in blood pressure about 40 millimetres, and here's our diseased animals where it was about 80 millimetres of mercury, certainly suggesting that there's increased sympathetic tone to the vasculature that's maintaining that high blood pressure. We've also looked at circulating levels of catecholamines. So in this panel here, we can see the levels of noradrenaline in these animals. Here's our control strain, and here's our Lewis polycystic kidney, and similarly when we look at adrenaline levels, we see a significant increase in the amount of circulating catecholamines. So indirectly, we would certainly appear to have increased global sympathetic tone in this strain of animal. We've also looked directly um, in these animals, so we've looked at the recording of sympathetic nerve activity in the anesthetised animal. So in this panel here, what you can see here on the right is just an example of a real-time recording from an animal under anaesthesia, the arterial pressure recording, and then here we have a concurrent recording of splanchnic sympathetic nerve activity, renal sympathetic nerve activity, and lumbar sympathetic nerve activity. And when we look at these three nerves in animals aged 12 weeks of age, what we interestingly see is if you look at the background recording or the baseline recordings once we've subtracted the background level of activity, the microvolt level of sympathetic nerve activity is greater in our LPK animals in all three nerves. So here's our Lewis compared to the LPK, um, here's the renal nerve, Lewis versus LPK, and the lumbar nerve, Lewis versus LPK. Now, this is a phenomenon, this increased microvolt level recording that we see in consistently in all our preparations. While there is some debate over the use of microvolt data as a measure of sympathetic nerve activity, um, it's certainly consistent with what we've been looking at. So this is uh, in support of our hypothesis of increased sympathetic nerve activity in these animals, um, but the caveat here is that these recordings are all made under anaesthesia. So, 
this is where we looked at doing telemetry and we wanted to do dual blood pressure and sympathetic nerve activities. And now I'll go through with you some of the advantages and also some of the challenges that we underwent. So certainly with regards to doing dual blood pressure and sympathetic nerve recordings, the advantage is the overcoming the impact of anesthesia. Um, various studies will show multiple effects on sympathetic nerve activity, both increase and decrease, and we can overcome that altogether. With regards to the handling of the animals, you, if you're using chronically tethered animals, there is a degree of restraint there. So um, for nerve activity or blood pressure recording, or if you've got tail cuff blood pressure recordings, there's restraint stress. So you overcome that because the animals can be recorded from in their home cage both day and night over a long-term cycle. By recording both dual, and, dual blood pressure and nerve activity, you can actually use this technique to validate the integrity of your sympathetic nerve recording, and I'll show you that in a moment. And furthermore, because we're measuring both blood pressure and nerve activity responses, when we're interested in autonomic reflex control, we can actually look at these reflexes um, directly and not um, try and guess what the nerves are doing in response in correlation with the blood pressure changes. So this is a real advantage for us in terms of our, our data analysis and studies. Technical challenges. Um, Fiona already mentioned that animal size is an issue and surgical risk. This is a, a dual procedure, so we're implanting both the blood pressure catheter and the nerve recording um, electrodes. We found that the animals need to be at least 175 grams in body weight, but because of our rat strain, which is a smaller strain of rat, the Lewis, and because of the disease process, which means that our animals are smaller still, um, and they're not necessarily very well, we find that we can't implant the probes until the animals are at least 220 grams body weight. So that pushes us out to an age of about 10 weeks, by which point the disease is already established in these animals. So that is a limitation for us. It is an invasive procedure, um, it takes longer with the dual implantations and the aortic implantation does have a risk of compromised blood flow to the hind limbs and paralysis. In our hands it takes at least a week for those animals to regain the circadian rhythms which Fiona mentioned um, and there is the, the loss of, of data collection throughout the study. So for us to validate our study we, read, we needed both dual blood pressure and sympathetic nerve data at the study endpoint which meant we had about a 72% success rate in those animals that recovered through to the initial um, one week period. There's also the issue of how you analyse your data. Do you look at microvolts? Do you look at percentage change data? Um, and the way we've come around this is that we tend to do both so that we present all those aspects of our data. So I mentioned that the, one of the advantages of the dual recordings is being able to validate your nerve activity as being nerve activity and not just noise. So here's that panel that I showed you before showing our control strain, our disease strain, our nerve activity and our blood pressure recordings. And what you can actually do is you can use this to show that you have a pulse modulation of your sympathetic nerve activity. So in these panels here we have our renal sympathetic nerve activity trace here, we have our blood pressure trace here, same for our diseased animals, our nerve activity, our blood pressure and you can see that we've got that lovely pulse modulation of our sympathetic nerve activity in as we see a pressure drop in our animals, we see a concurrent change in the um, nerve activity, as the pressure goes up we see the concurrent decrease in the nerve activity. So that beautiful bowel reflex modulated activity there is really nice, that tight coupling. Um, now we've looked at the baseline sympathetic nerve activity and as I mentioned visibly when you look here they do appear to be different. Um, we subtract the noise at the end of the experiment by using the death levels of the nerve activity recording and you can see again here we've seen this phenomenon where the baseline sympathetic nerve activity in our diseased animals is greater than what we see in our um, control strain. So again, a, a carry on of this, this phenomenon that I've described before. So what did we actually find with this study? Um, just to give you an example of some of the things we're able to determine using this dual SNA and BP system. So in this panel what we did was we looked at the relationship between real sympathetic nerve activity and mean arterial pressure in individual animals, looking to support the hypothesis that the increased SNA and specifically the renal sympathetic nerve activity is associated with the high blood pressure. And as you can see here, with, these are our Lewis animals with the open circles, these are our Lewis polycystic kidney animals with the uh, closed in circles, and with the higher blood pressures in the LPK animals we have a correlating higher increase in renal sympathetic nerve activity that was statistically significant. Um, so this relationship would again um, support our underlying hypothesis and also provide a potential mechanistic explanation for the decrease in blood pressure that is seen after renal sympathetic nerve denervation, but of course cause and effect are yet to be determined.
Here I'm showing you an example of one of the reflex responses. So in this case we looked at the central chemo reflex response and to do this what we did was place the animals in a plasmography chamber. Um, once they were settled we got a baseline recording shown here at time zero and then we exposed the animals to 7% CO2, so a hypercatnic stimulus. And typically what you see in this situation is a pressor and sympathoexcitatory response. So this is our time data over a five minute period and you can see here in our Lewis animal we get an increase in blood pressure. Similarly, we get a, what appears to be a slight increase in our diseased animals and you get an increase in sympathetic nerve activity. Now, interestingly, what we showed in this disease strain was that the pressor response was significantly attenuated in our diseased animals, as was the sympathoexcitatory response. So this um, impairment of the, the um, central chemo reflex to us suggested that there may already be tonic activation in these reflex of these diseased animals, which impairs a further relative increase in SNA and blood pressure, which we think is likely uh, mediated or at the level of the central nervous system. In this particular example, we looked at a st acute stress response. So again, we measured the mean arterial pressure and renal sympathetic nerve responses, and the animals in this particular example were placed in an open filled chamber with a bright light shine onto them, and then there was, there was no escape. Again, in this particular type of stressor, you should see a, a pressor and sympathoexcitatory response. And certainly if you look here in our top panel, here's a time response. These are our control animals, increase in blood pressure. Um, and you should also see an increase in sympathetic nerve activity. Again, you look at our control animals, an increase in sympathetic nerve activity. We see a similar increase in our diseased animals, but again, it's been significantly attenuated. So the degree of the pressor response and the degree of the sympathoexcitatory is significantly reduced. This was not expected, we didn't um, anticipate this change, uh, so this led us to suspect that possibly the stress mediated pathways in these animals are also tonically activated or it's possible that the already elevated levels of sympathetic nerve activity limit the further increase. Again, this is likely central mediated um, and would be consistent with impaired central autonomic control of sympathetic outflow. So in conclusion, we've used dual renal sympathetic nerve activity and blood pressure telemetry recording in a rodent model of chronic kidney disease. Um, we have, I believe, confirmed enhanced sympathetic nerve activity, noting that, of course, we can only comment on the renal sympathetic nerves, but it correlates strongly with the increased blood pressure in this model. We've also showed impaired chemoreflex and stress-induced both pressor and sympathoexcitatory responses, which are consistent with impaired central processing of autonomic reflexes. So what's next? Next, what do we want to do? Um, these recordings were made in animals uh, one week after that initial implantation, so we had a two-week recording period. What we really would like to do is look for temporal changes in sympathetic nerve activity in association with the disease progression. So that's where we need to look at longer term recording um, in individual animals. We have had some success of a longer recording period and I'm just showing you some examples here. So here we have a 12 week old Lewis animal, renal sympathetic nerve activity, both the raw and integrated data. Um, here's the average mean arterial pressure response and here's the same animal out to 18 weeks. So we've looked at six weeks post implantation data. We've had a similar um, success in some Lewis polycystic kidney animals. Here's our 12 week data raw, integrated and blood pressure and here is our 18 week old animal, same animal recorded out to six weeks. We don't have enough animals yet to be able to draw any conclusions from this data but our preliminary analysis suggests that we can track an increase in the renal sympathetic nerve activity. So it is possible to main, maintain recordings out to a significant time frame um, but the success rate at this point for us has been about 30 to 40 percent to six weeks. So in conclusion, um, conscious telemetry recording sympathetic nerve activity overcomes many of the limitations of some of the other indirect and also direct measures of sympathetic nerve activity. It is technically challenging, um, you need to be able to validate your recordings and there's also additional considerations such as animal size which is of more importance when you're considering disease models. Uh, longitudinal data collection is possible and I suppose our dream or our wish is for smaller pros because what we'd love to do is be able to implant our animals at a much younger age before the disease is particularly overt and then be able to track the changes in blood pressure and nerve activity um, as the disease develops. Um, so last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, the people who did most of this research um, in the lab, Ibrahim Salman, Kara Hildreth, Divya Salman-Kentakuri, Joanne Harrison and Dr. Sarah Jane Guild from Miller who helped us with a lot of technical advice for the feature. So thank you very much. Okay. Um...
Jackie, a question for you. Um, do you think the response you detected in the LPK rat model is specific to your model of um, CKD, or would you expect the same response in another CKD model, for example, the 5 6 nephrectomy model? Yeah, no, look, that's a really good question. Without actually doing the experiments in a different model of CKD, you can't state absolutely. But certainly the typical behaviour of um, nerve activity in studies in humans with kidney disease, kidney disease, where they look at all sorts of types of kidney disease that result in chronic um, hypertension, show similar increases in muscle sympathetic nerve activity, um, similar changes in autonomic reflexes, and in terms of the renal denervation studies, there's been no uh, factors that differentiate different types of CKD. So I think we will see similar changes in other models because what you're looking at is a condition where the sensory signals from the kidney, um, which are associated with hypoxia, uh, poor tissue perfusion, renal ischemia, and um, the buildup of the nephrotoxins are likely stimulating centrally a lot of the changes in outflow. So yes, I anticipate we'd see very similar changes. Okay, great. Um... Excellent answer. Um, just have to sort through all these questions. For Fiona, does it matter where the intracranial pressure sensor is placed in the brain in relation to the pressures uh, recorded? Uh, no, that's a good question. Uh, there's been many studies which have looked at measuring uh, pressure at various points around the brain or within the ventricles, and it seems that the, the pressure within the skull is the same uh, no matter where you measure it. So my advice would be to, uh, the simplest and least invasive approach is, is to just pop it under the skull subdurally um, and, and be confident that, that that's giving you sort of the pressure experienced by, by the whole brain. Okay, perfect. And um, also with regards to the oxygen electrode, when inserting the oxygen electrode in the brain, uh, does it result in any damage and scar tissue formation over time? And I guess consequently, will it affect the value of the oxygen concentration that you're recording? Yeah, that, that's an important point to consider, um, especially for your experimental design. So um, as with all physiological experiments, it's important to include a, a control group um, to, to allow for that. Um, but as a general comment, the, with careful placement under stereotactics, you're not um, you're minimally disrupting the brain tissue as you insert the electrode, which is itself very fine. Um, I think, yeah, you're doing, of course you're doing some damage, but I think it's very, very, very minimal. Um, and the, the signals themselves seem to be stable for long periods of time. Uh, if you get them secured nicely to the skull, there's no movements or anything which, which could affect the signal. So I think, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty robust. Okay, perfect. Um, Fiona, I think this is uh, for you as well. Um, you had shown some data um, during your presentation and uh, Noah mentions that it looks like uh, there's a time lag for the change in tissue oxygen, which was about five minutes approximately, yeah. uh, from the time of exposure to hyperoxic hypercapnia, and um, the question is, does that reflect what is happening in the tissue? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it could be a feature of the way in which we deliver the hypercapnia. So to do that, we, we put the, the rats in a, in, a, in a box and we have to switch them from breathing room air to, to breathing the hypercapnic gas mix. And it, you know, you don't want to throw the gas in there at 100 miles an hour. So, so I think it takes time for the actual air that the animal's breathing to change, which would slow that rate down. I also think it's possible that there is a little bit of a time lag um, between what the animal's breathing in, because that, that different gas mix has to get filtered into the blood um, and reach the brain. And then we're not measuring uh, arterial oxygen, we're measuring tissue oxygen, so I think it all takes just that little bit longer to, to filter through to the point of measurement. Um, but certainly I, in my experience with the oxygen electrodes, I wouldn't expect them to have a really fast dynamic response. Um, even on the bench, they, they do take um, a minute to uh, come up to a, a step change in oxygen uh, on the bench, so, so you're more looking at a, yeah, a, a sort of smooth change, I guess. Okay. Um, hopefully that answers Noah's question. Uh, thank you very much. The, um, another question here um, 
I guess starting with you, Jackie, and um, you know Sandy or, or Fiona, you can you can uh, chime in as well. Uh, Vladimir asks, uh, is it possible to measure the activity of other nerves other than the renal sympathetic nerve? Yes, absolutely. So there's been a paper published in the name of the group, just slips my mind, um, where they looked at uh, I think it was splanchnic nerve activity, and certainly. Um, the approach will be different for the implantation, um, but the technique and the procedure should be equally applicable, uh, particularly to some of these abdominal located nerves or retroperitoneal nerves that you can access that will um, enable that recording. And certainly that's something we want to do um, because that means you get a look at these other sympathetic nerve outflows. So yes, there's been a study done um, and it's something that I can't see there'd be any difficulties associated with other than the, the implantation. Okay. I'd like to comment briefly, I've, I've published uh, a paper a few years ago recording lumbar sympathetic nerve activity. Um, there's just a few different considerations with different nerves. Um, the lumbar one, you're a lot closer to the, the back muscles, um, so it was much more, it was very difficult to avoid getting some movement artifacts. We had to be uh, very aware when we looked at the data to, to try and get it from periods when the animal was quiet, etc. I think there's a group in Japan has recently published a study where they've done renal and lumbar simultaneously. Fantastic. So there's definitely, yes, definitely possibilities out there. Yeah, so I've got a little bit to chime in as well. Um, you kind of really just got to consider the accessibility to your nerve of interest. And the other thing is that um, our telemeters are designed um, with a input range of uh, plus or mi uh, from minus 60 microvolts to plus 60 microvolts. So it may not be suitable for all nerves. So for example, the vagus nerves, it may not actually be suitable for that uh, because it might fall outside the range of uh, our SNA inputs. Okay. Um, perfect. Thank you all for your, your answers there. And the questions keep on coming in uh, sort of fast and furious. I'll try my best to, to sift through these um, as they come in. And just a reminder, if we don't get to your question during the session, we will be sure to answer it after the fact. Jackie, uh, this is directed to, to you. And again, um, Fiona and Sandy, if you have some input, please provide it. But um, William asks, um, how long can you keep a stable um, SNA signal for? And how long do you have to wait until getting a stable um, SNA baseline? Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, it does, yes. So I'll answer the first part first, <laughs> the second part first. Um, with regards to getting the stable SNA baseline, we, because of the issues of recovering from surgery um, and wanting to get a re-established circadian rhythms, we didn't really look at our data too closely before one week. But having said that, um, in the animals, once we've recovered them and taken them back to our animal house and put them on the receiver, we do see lovely baseline sympathetic nerve activity. Um, how useful it is in terms of assessing the status of the animal is another question, but certainly once that sort of first 24-hour period is over, we do get nice, nice recordings. Um, Fiona might be able to comment on that more. With regards to the long-term recordings, um, we have, a, as I showed you, we're able to take out to six weeks post-implantation. So um, the issue is that we, if we lost either the nerve activity or the blood pressure activity, we then terminated those animals because we needed both at the, the finalisation of the experiment. In terms of those animals that did go out to six weeks, I said it was about 30 to 40 percent. Um, and the recordings we got at six weeks were looked fantastic. Um, it's just getting out to that point. So we haven't done enough yet there to give a, a good answer, but certainly I think it is possible. Fiona, okay. what would you say? Yeah, I think just, just, just the caveat is that, I mean, these, these are really difficult recordings to make. Um, if you're coming in with no surgical experience, I think you should um, set your expectations low and plan maybe some anaesthetised or some very short studies to begin with and, and build up. Um, I don't think, I think there'd be very few people that could jump in and, and plan to do a, a four-month nerve, nerve recording, um, as Jackie's hoping to do. So. I think you just want to yeah, be sensible about it and build up the skills and, and expertise to, to be able to produce these type of recordings. There's, there's no magic trick, it's just careful, um, very precise surgery. Okay, perfect. Um, 
All right. Um, Velu asks, um, let's see here, the uh, amplitude of nerve activity is dependent on electrode placement. That's a statement he's making. Um, so the question is, how can one compare the activity from one animal to another? Yeah, look, I can jump in there initially. Um, that is a continual source of debate. Um, so we get that same question arising with our acute experiments as well. And all I can say is that uh, consistently we see in our animals an increased level of that baseline activity um, with the nerve recording at the microvolt level. The placement of the electrode, the contact, all those things do make a difference. Um, and so that's why I think you do need to have those other types of verification studies. So in our case, we can look at um, looking at one animal over time. And also you can look at your percentage chain response to reflex um, stimuli to see if you can get another handle on what that autonomic nervous system is doing. But look, it's a, it's a good question and it's one that I think will be continued to be debated for a long time. Okay. Yeah, i just add, if, if at all possible, if you can design a, a with an animal um, study, um, obviously Jackie's unable to because of the, the duration of their model, but if you can design a with animal study, a change for baseline with a control group, you've got a lot more power to, to look at these effects. Even if you have to normalize the baseline, you can look at the change from baseline. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, we'll ask a few more questions. We're coming to the end of our hour, but um, um, Jackie, with respect to the SNA sensor, can you talk a little bit more about um, sort of how and where you attached the sensing element? In terms of the placement of the electrode on the renal nerve? Yes. Yeah, so um, the attachment is placed um, with the renal nerve where it is exposed via, we go through a, a flank approach um, in the retroperitoneal space and exposed down through coming off near the, um, the artery. And the higher you go tends to be the better. Um, I don't know, Fiona, what would your comments be about placement in terms of technical tips? Um, just great care. <laughs> yeah, just really like try and all of your surgical movements. You want to try and keep the nerve in the same place, and yeah, just try and disrupt the nerve from its natural path as little as possible. Um, if you stretch or bend the nerve, um, that that's when it's gonna gonna die, um, and you'll lose your signal. So just yeah, really good surgical microscope. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah, and we also, a lot of our, I was just stand out to say, a lot of um, when um, my PhD student Ibrahim who did these studies was training, we spent a lot of time just dissecting the nerve on post-euthanasia post-euthanasia animals just to get a familiarity because where the nerve is, what it looks like, um, that in itself takes a bit of practice. Uh, just chiming in here, there's actually a really um, good uh, techniques paper on chronic um, recording by uh, Stoker in 2013 um, titled uh, Recording Sympathetic Nerve Activity Chronically in Rats. So it goes through surgical techniques and it's probably worth um, actually having a look at that paper if you're interested. It's got some really good figures as well. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, There's also a training video that Miller supplied um, us that was really good too because you actually see someone doing the surgery online. Okay, and uh, Sandy, uh, we'll make sure that during the uh, in the Q and A report that we distribute, we reference that paper that you mentioned uh, by Stoker et al. from 2013. Uh, let's ask one more question, and um, just being respectful of every, everyone's time, there still are many more to answer, but. Um, um, Fiona, you had mentioned that um, you know there are other tissues and organs where one can use the oxygen sensor, but um, I guess the question is, can it be used to measure oxygen concentrations in blood? Um, yeah, that's, I'm glad that came up. Um, so at the moment, uh, it's not recommended to use the sensor in blood, so it, it's been validated and proven in, in tissue only. Um, so there's been a paper published showing oxygen recordings in the kidney, for example, um, and you could die the organs. Um, I think that the problem with the blood is that it, it might disrupt or, or block the carbon sensing tip, um, which is really fragile and, and sort of needs protection. So 
um, yeah, as far as I'm aware, no, no one's figured out any tricks to, to make it work in, in arterial blood yet. Okay. Um, Sandy or, or um, Jackie, do you have any input on, on that? Uh, Sandy, you're probably aware of what others are doing with uh, the technology. Um, yeah, so um, I don't think this is published yet, but we have had um, one of our customers use the tissue oxygen probe to measure um, oxygen concentration in the liver. So in theory, if you have a solid organ with enough space to implant the three electrodes, you should be able to get um, oxygen concentration from it. So currently, uh, we know it. We know that it does work in brain, kidney, and um, in our, from our customer in liver. Um, but yes, as Fiona um, has mentioned, that there is a little bit of concern with um, putting the um, carbon paste electrode into a flowing medium such as blood vessels or lymphatic vessels or even an amniotic fluid um, because there is concerns, concerns that it might disturb the carbon paste right at the sensing tip.